So, and just to uh, let everyone know as they're calling in, this is a webinar uh, kind of uh, situation. So uh, there's, there's the speaker and, uh, and the uh, panelist, are, which is really the, the hosts. And then uh, everyone else is on the um, is on the webinar, and uh, I guess we can get started. So this is the list of of the the past seminars that we have had in the past, and the one uh, that we're going to have today. Um, this is our last scheduled seminar in the series, but uh, I do want to just mention that you might want to stay tuned for potential. Uh, invites for future seminars because one of the things that we've been doing is going through looking at what we've talked about and maybe what we would like to cover at a little more depth. And so um, so uh, there may be some more, right? We realize we would like to talk a little bit more about a particular uh, aspect of kidney uh, effects or function or something like that, or uh, we, we may end up having some Well, I think Joe froze, but to the point he was getting at is, you know, in the conversations we've had behind the scenes, it looks like there are possibly more topics that are going to be of interest. So just to stay tuned, all of the people that have been viewing these um, seminars, and we can potentially add more to the schedule in the future. Oops. And... Then just a couple of logistics for the rest of this seminar. Um, this presentation will be recorded for transcription purposes. Um, the transcripts from the seminars will be, will be, oh. Joe, are you back? I'm back, yeah. Okay, I, I moved on, <laughs> you, you cut out for a minute. I moved on to okay. logistics for you. Oh, great. So I guess the one thing that we'll just say is, is that, um, Please, if you have any uh, questions, don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A. Vice. Um, yes, and uh, it, right, and to reiterate, attendees will all be muted during these presentations um, and unmuting will be enabled for questions and answers. Okay. Sorry, sorry for a little bit of confusion, I dropped off. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Dr. Jay Rappaport and Dr. Josh Fessel, who have ably um, led the, the organization and the, the hosted this series. And um, I'm gonna ask them to do the introductions. So thank you very much and appreciate everyone for calling in. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. It's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce Dr. Shelley Verhadian. Uh, Dr. Verhadian uh, received her PhD from Rockefeller University uh, and her uh, medical degree from Cornell Weill Medical College. Uh, she did her internship and residency uh, in internal medicine uh, at Yale New Haven Hospital. She did a clinical fellowship in, in ID at Yale School of Medicine. <clears throat> and after that, she did a, a, actually uh, a postdoctoral T32 fellowship in a program in, in, in aging at Yale School of Medicine. Uh, she was, uh, has been uh, first an instructor, then an assistant professor, which was uh, supported by a K-23 award. Um, uh, in, in, and that was in infectious disease. And now she's uh, funded by uh, NIAID through an R01. She's multi-PI multi with uh, uh, Akiko Iwasaki, who gave the previous uh, uh, talk in this series. And she's also funded by Merck, other uh, foundations. She's very well published and, and she's, uh, you know, in, in high impact journals, JCI, Nature Medicine, Journal of Immunology, among others. <clears throat> 
and is a, a recognized expert in this area and collaborates uh, nationally in the area of SARS-CoV-2 and PASC and, you know, gives lectures, you know, multiple venues. And I, I actually had the pleasure of uh, attending the, the neurologic and psychiatric effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection workshop that she uh, spoke at from the NIH, which was fantastic. And it's, you know, I'd like to welcome Dr. Farhadian and, you know, introduce our talk, Neurological Symptoms During and After uh, COVID-19, What Can We Learn from Cerebral Spinal Fluid? Dr. Farhadian. Well, thank you so much. Um, and really to the organizers for including me in this important um, seminar series. Let me just share my screen. Okay, great. Um, so as you can tell from the title of the talk, I'm gonna be talking today about um, our studies that we did in patients with acute COVID-19 and how some of what we learned has informed our approach um, to studying symptoms um, in PASC. So from the start of the epidemic, uh, it was clear that although SARS-CoV-2 is primarily a respiratory virus, a subset of infected individuals were showing symptoms outside of the lung. Um, and from the earliest reports, this one here came out of China that were primarily observational studies. Um, the frequency of neurological symptoms in people admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, um, you know, at first was reported somewhere around, as you can see, 36%. That number maybe has changed a little bit. Um, but as you can see here, the range of neurological symptoms that was reported from this cohort from China was quite broad. So including things like headache, dizziness, um, much less frequently seizure and um, stroke. And these reports have also come out of um, other places around the world, including one I'm showing here from Chile, which you can see um, headache was also very frequently part of the acute COVID-19 syndrome. Since that time, I think the studies have been refined quite a bit. And here I'm just showing you one example. This is a nice study that came out of NYU where they used a case control design um, and specifically asked what percentage of um, patients who were admitted with COVID-19 had a new neurological disorder that was uh, recognized or diagnosed during that acute hospitalization. Here you can see that about 13% presented with a new neurological complaint. And again, many of these are quite nonspecific, including the most frequent, which is toxic or metabolic encephalopathy. And then again, stroke, seizure, neuropathy, these are less commonly reported. Importantly, there were no cases of a classic encephalitis or meningitis, and the cerebrospinal fluid, when it was tested, was not overtly inflammatory in most cases. So you can see that it was rare to have a leukocytosis or an increased white blood cell count in the CSF. Um, and other clinical markers uh, in the CSF were primarily normal as well. So I want to take a step back and echo something actually that Dr. Iwasaki mentioned when she was on last week also, which is that I think it's important to remember that so much of what we're studying now may not be specific to COVID-19 and may be a feature of viral infection in general. So here I'm showing you a table that came from a really nice review that came out earlier this year. Um, and the authors went through each of the WHO diseases of epidemic and pandemic potential. Um, and you can see they listed here what is the evidence for neurological manifestations with these various diseases, um, including you know, all the way from chikungunya to cholera to influenza, whether a pathogen was found in the CSF or not for these cases. Um, and I just want to point this out to say that the questions that we're asking are questions that I think are relevant beyond simply SARS-CoV-2 infection. When it comes to SARS-CoV-2, some of our local work um, focused on um, what were some of the neurological manifestations that we were seeing in our own hospital. So this is work that was led by my mentor, Dr. Sputich, and by uh, Lindsay McAlpine, who is a senior fellow in neurology. Um, and they, during the acute pandemic in Connecticut, started a neuro-COVID consultation service. So um, patients who were in the hospital who had a neurological complaint uh, and needed a neuro-consult 
would be diverted towards this specialized service. Um, what they found, first of all, is that the ethnic makeup of COVID-19 patients with neurological symptoms did not reflect the um, population of our state. So you can see here um, that they were primarily being uh, consulted on white patients, but you know the number of black patients who are having neurological complaints higher than what we were seeing in Connecticut overall, which I think reflects the fact that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected minorities in our state, um, and of course across the US as well. Um, high mortality associated, and again, this was during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, and in terms of the neurological disorders that they were reporting on, um, actually seizure and stroke were very common amongst the complaints um, that they were consulted on. Um, and other less common um, neuromuscular complaints, uh, myositis, neuropathy, uh, et cetera. So how is it that a respiratory virus leads to neurological uh, complications? I think we can say now that it's certainly a multifactorial process. So we know that other respiratory viruses like RSV and influenza can cause neurological sequelae through many different paths, including through direct viral invasion of the central nervous system. Um, but other uh, methods beyond just viral invasion of the brain seem to be at play uh, here and in other um, respiratory viruses as well. I've listed here some of the areas that are very active areas of research when it comes to neurocovid. So groups that are specifically focusing on understanding the role of small vessel thrombosis or microclots and autoimmunity, which I'm gonna get back to in our talk today. How much does endothelial damage by the virus and by the local immune response in the endothelium um, contribute? How much of what we're seeing in the brain is just a mirror of what's going on in the peripheral blood? So systemic inflammation that um, is a secondary consequence affects the brain. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing primarily on the potential role for immune-mediated damage, including autoimmunity to neurological sequelae of COVID-19. So first, you know, at the beginning, I think a lot of the research was focused on a very simple question, which was, does the virus infect the brain? Certainly, the virus has the potential to infect neurons. So I'm showing you here a schematic from a review that we published very early in the um, pandemic. Um, and you can see that the research taken as a whole suggests that ACE2, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 virus, is distributed widely throughout the brain. Um, and what I'm not showing you here, here are some really nice studies done by colleagues at Yale and elsewhere using model systems like brain organoids that also demonstrate the potential for SARS-CoV-2 to infect the brain. As the months unfolded though, and autopsy studies became available, I think we began to get a more complete picture um, regarding viral neuroinvasion during COVID-19. And ultimately, I think after looking at several autopsy cohorts, I think we can say that viral neuroinvasion does occur, but it's probably rare and or short-lived. So for example, in one of the largest uh, autopsy studies was a German cohort in which 43 brains were examined. About half of them were positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein, but importantly, areas of the brain in which the virus was detected were not the areas of the brain that had the most profound neuropathological changes which in general were quite mild in this um, series. In the New York City cohort, which was smaller and was individuals who um, experienced sudden death with COVID-19, there was widespread microvascular injury detected, but the virus was not detected in any sample. Further studies show that um, neurons do not appear to be overtly infected um, based on autopsy studies, but vascular epithelium does seem to be particularly prone to infection and to localized inflammation. So while the autopsy study suggested that viral neuroinvasion was rare, or as I mentioned, a short-lived phenomenon that perhaps wasn't being caught at the time of autopsy, in contrast, several brain autopsy studies during COVID showed evidence for CNS immune activation in affected patients. 
So here I'm showing you just a few examples from studies that have been published over the last year, highlighting what are some of the common immune findings, including nodules of activated microglial cells and T cell infiltration. So here you can see um, these patches of microglial uh, nodules, um, a really nice study that used imaging mass cytometry to show um, infiltration of cytotoxic T cells. Again, microvascular injury, which I showed you before from the New York City cohort. And um, these are some of the common findings. But of course, autopsy studies are limited and they don't reflect what's happening in the central nervous system in living humans. And so we asked whether we could assess for neuroimmune responses in patients with acute COVID-19 by studying the CSF, which is an approach we had taken previously, um, primarily in HIV and in other infections. So why study CSF? CSF can be thought of as a window to the brain. So CSF is produced within the brain and immune cells that are circulating in the CSF reflect those that have crossed the blood-brain barrier and are poised to enter the brain parenchyma. To understand whether there was a CNS-specific immune response during COVID-19, our study was designed to analyze paired blood and CSF from COVID-19 patients and uninfected controls. And here I've listed some of the studies that can be undertaken on CSF to give us a glimpse into what might be happening in the brain. So by looking at the CSF cells, we can and did perform immune cell profiling, including single profiling of B and T cells. Um, and within the CSF supernatant, we find antibodies, soluble cytokines. We can examine for the presence of virus using PCR approaches. Um, and can even through clinical markers assess for blood-brain barrier disruption. So to summarize our question for this uh, first half of the talk is whether there's a CNS specific immune response during acute COVID-19. So to answer this and many other questions about COVID-19 pathogenesis and epidemiology, I worked with colleagues at the School of Medicine and at the School of Public Health at Yale to form the IMPACT Biorepository, which Dr. Osaki had introduced to you last week. And this is a study that we started in March of 2020 and was designed to capture data and biospecimens from hospitalized patients. Um, we've enrolled over 350 patients to date, collecting clinical, demographic, epidemiological data, multiple tissue specimens, including in some cases cerebrospinal fluid for um, people who are undergoing clinical lumbar punctures. Um, and within the IMPACT cohort, we've had um, some special populations that we've done um, studies on, including pregnant women, um, and what I'll be talking about today, which is our neurological cohort. So prior work from other groups suggested that cytokine storm or exuberant cytokine responses in the peripheral blood associated with severe COVID-19 disease. We wondered whether the inflammatory profile in the CSF would reflect that of the blood or whether there was a divergent or a compartmentalized reaction happening within the CNS. To do this, we measured levels of 71 inflammatory cytokines in the CSF and in the blood of our COVID patients and controls. So what I'm showing you here are, is a heat map demonstrating the level of um, individual cytokines in the COVID patients in purple, in the controls in green, in the CSF, and in the plasma. And what we found in this small sample was that certain cytokines, including IL-1 and IL-12, were elevated markedly in the CSF of the COVID patients, but not in the blood, and vice versa. When we then validated these findings through single cell RNA sequencing, we likewise found that some of these same pathways were found to be upregulated at the gene expression level in CSF T cells, but not in the T cells of the blood, um, and in particular in COVID-19 patients and not in controls. Overall, these studies together demonstrate a compartmentalized immune response to COVID-19 in the CNS. Um, and I should say that similar studies have now been done by other groups, including um, REMSIC and colleagues um, that validate these findings as well. So what I showed you so far has primarily focused on cellular immunity in the CNS, but what about humoral responses? 
So to better understand antiviral antibodies in the CIS, we collaborated with Michael Wilson's group at UCSF, who had recently developed a custom multiplex ELISA to look for antibodies against numerous SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. So what I'm showing you here um, are um, ELISA results for COVID patients and healthy controls in the plasma and in the CSF. And what we're looking for is reactivity against SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the receptor binding domain, nucleocapsid protein, and then various SARS-CoV-2 epidopes that were previously found to be immunogenic. I want to just to make this kind of uh, more simple focus on just one participant, one patient uh, to start. So you can see this patient who we'll call COVID-1 had antibodies against spike and the receptor binding domain, but not against the nucleocapsid in their plasma. And in the CSF, this same person was found to have antibodies against spike, RBD, and nucleocapsid. So a different antibody profile in the CSF compared to the plasma in the same patient. And when we look across all of the participants um, for which we ran the ELISA panel, we see that within an individual person, the antibody response in the CSF is not simply a mirror of the antibody response in the peripheral blood. All patients had anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in both the CSF and in the plasma, but the CSF antibodies targeted different epitopes than the serum antibodies. These results suggest that antiviral antibodies in the CSF do not simply reflect passive transfer of antibodies from the periphery and perhaps indirect evidence that antibodies in the CSF may be being produced locally in response to a local viral antigen within the CSF. So to better understand the nature of these CNS-specific antibodies, we um, worked with Michael and others to produce monoclonal antibodies based off of B-cell receptor sequences derived from patients with COVID-19. So first here, I just want to show you that CSF B cells are expanded in patients with COVID compared to controls. Normal healthy controls have very few B cells found in their CSF. Whereas patients with COVID-19, you could see the frequency of B cells in the spinal fluid is markedly um, expanded. When we take the participant who had the most B cells in their CSF, and do single B cell receptor sequencing to understand the clonality of those B cells. What we can see, first of all, in the PBMC, we see um, one significantly expanded B cell clone and then other expanded clones as well. Not surprising, this person is fighting against an acute viral infection. I would expect them to have expanded B cells in their blood. In the CSF also though, we also find these expanded clones. We took these sequences for the B cell receptors and made patient-derived monoclonal antibodies. Here I'm showing you the monoclonal antibodies. So we made five from the CSF of the participant and four that came from the peripheral blood B cells of this research participant and assessed for reactivity against SARS-CoV-2 antigens using the Luminex panel I showed you before. Here I'm just showing you the results for reactivity against spike protein. And you can see that two of the monoclonals from the blood and one of the monoclonals from the CSF were reactive against spike protein. Again, not terribly surprising because this person is fighting against um, an acute viral infection, as I mentioned. What was interesting to us though, was when we then asked, well, what are the other monoclonal antibodies, these, these expanded B cell clones in the CSF, what are they targeting? We worked with Chris Bartley and Sam Pleasure at UCSF to ask whether these expanded B cell clones might be autoreactive. So um, Chris did some really beautiful staining of mouse brains using these CSF-derived monoclonal antibodies to ask whether they were reactive against brain tissue. And you can see that many of them were. So here I'm just showing you that monoclonal antibodies C1, C2, and C4 were all interreactive against mouse brain tissue. Intriguingly to us, one of these uh, monoclonals that was reactive against the brain tissue was also the monoclonal antibody that was reactive against spike. 
And this suggests some cross-reactivity between antiviral antibodies and brain tissue itself. How common though is auto, our autoantibodies in the CSF of COVID patients? So what I showed you before, again, those were uh, monoclonals that were based off of a single patient CSF. Here we took whole CSF from the rest of our cohort. And again, using the mouse brain tissue staining, Dr. Bartley and Dr. Pleasure demonstrated that five out of the seven cases that we tested showed immunoreactivity against brain tissue. So it, taken together, this demonstrates, I think, a high burden of autoimmunity within the CNS of acute COVID-19. Um, and I should say that when we looked at um, control CSF, a uh, far lower number of cases demonstrated autoreactivity and the titers at which um, they were autoreactive were much lower. So demonstrating many more autoimmune antibodies in the CSF of COVID-19 patients. Okay, so everything I've shown you so far was based off of our studies of people with COVID-19. But pretty soon after that first wave, we began to get calls from um, clinicians and patients who had recovered from COVID-19, but were now having odd neurological symptoms. And I would say that at the beginning, the symptoms were quite profound that we were hearing about. So here's one case, for example. This is a young guy um, locally to us who um, developed fever and malaise, soon thereafter tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by a mesopharyngeal swab, and at that time started to have some psychiatric symptoms. So delusions, which over the course of the next several weeks uh, became more severe, eventually prompting several visits to the emergency room. Um, he had no response to typical antipsychotic treatment. His MRI was normal. His CSF was sent for clinical testing for autoimmune antibodies, as well as for other markers, it was essentially normal. Um, at this point, uh, our NeuroID team, and specifically Dr. McAlpine and Dr. Spudich were consultant on this case and decided to empirically treat the patient with IVIG with the assumption that there may be an undiagnosed autoimmune um, phenomenon here. Patient did make a recovery and generously donated his CSF and blood for research studies. So again, collaborating with Dr. Wilson, Dr. Pleasure, and Dr. Bartley at UCSF, we were able to demonstrate that this patient's CSF did um, show evidence for autoimmunity with reactivity against brain tissue, which I'm showing you here, again, through the mouse brain immunostaining. So suggesting that maybe some of the phenomenon that we had um, observed in acute COVID-19 was potentially at play in some patients with post-acute symptoms. So our conclusions from our studies of COVID are that the virus is rarely or never detected in the CSF. Antiviral antibodies are present in the CSF and interestingly are different from those in the blood of the same patient. Our cytokine and single cell studies show that CSF immune cells show divergent activation pathways when compared to the peripheral blood and that most of the neurocovid patients we tested had autoimmune antibodies but the clinical significance of these antibodies, I wanna emphasize, remains unknown. Okay, so shifting gears, I wanna talk a little bit now about post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 um, and how we might approach uh, some of the neurological issues that are now being raised. So here in our hospital, we're very lucky, we're sort of past the first, second, and third waves of COVID and we, have very few patients who are admitting now with acute COVID-19, um, but our clinical, uh, our clinics are being really overwhelmed with people who are coming in with post-acute complaints. Um, and specifically, we've set up a neuro-COVID clinic to try to address some of these issues. From a research standpoint, I think it's important to point out that the epidemiology of neurological sequelae of COVID is still very poorly understood. So many of the um, papers that have been published and widely cited, I think in the press so far, have severe limitations that make it harder for us to know the true scope of this problem. So many of these studies have been survey-based, uh, largely observational, 
inherently limited by selection bias, um, and as a result, really don't capture all the groups that have been affected by COVID-19. Um, some of these studies have very broad inclusion criteria, including um, people who never tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. And so while many of those individuals may have had COVID, many probably did not. Um, and so uh, the research is really based on very mixed populations. And importantly, studies that have been published, it, it's difficult to separate new onset neuropsychiatric disease from exacerbation of prior disease. Um, and so just to you know, point out some of the studies that I think have contributed much to our understanding, but have severe limitations. So one of the most widely uh, cited studies that included thousands of internet respondents, um, the makeup of this study was primarily female, primarily white, so not representative of the COVID-19 affected population, a very high rate of cognitive and memory symptoms, but only 27% of the participants in this study had a PCR or antibody test that was diagnostic for COVID-19. Similarly, in another uh, paper that was uh, recently published and widely studied, um, these were patients who had confirmed COVID-19, who were then contacted by researchers. And um, uh, about a quarter of them reported moderate to severe PTSD symptoms. And interestingly, they found that the post-COVID PTSD was significantly associated with the presence of a prior psychiatric disorder. I think importantly pointing out that for these studies, we really need to do our best to try to understand um, prior comorbidities uh, going into COVID. I think the other important thing to take into account when we're performing and assessing these research studies of neurological sequelae of COVID-19 is the idea that COVID-19 itself was a traumatic event for all of us. And um, so I wanna first of all, point out the work of Emily Troyer who presented a lot of this at um, the recent NIMH meeting. Um, but that when we think about the um, neurological consequences of living through COVID-19, it can be hard to tease that apart from the consequences of the virus itself. Um, and just sort of to highlight that, healthcare workers, for example, who served during COVID-19, Studies suggest that between 10 and 55% of them are affected by PTSD, even those who did not themselves contract COVID. Studies in the general population that were done after the SARS um, pandemic showed that 10 to 35% of SARS survivors reported PTSD. And that interestingly, those who had friends or close relatives who also had SARS were two to three times more likely to develop PTSD again, suggesting that the trauma of the pandemic had affected their own mental health. But for us, I think we're in a place where we really don't know what the risk factors are for developing pandemic-related PTSD. Um, and then of course, again, mentioned by Dr. Iwasaki last week, but just to point out that ICU stays themselves are associated with post-acute um, post-traumatic stress disorder, where even in non-COVID-related studies, 25 to 35% of people who have been in an ICU experience post-ICU PTSD. I think one of the best studies that tries to account for many of these factors in reporting on the epidemiology of neuro and psychiatric outcomes of COVID-19 um, was published by Taquette et al. in Lancet Psychiatry recently. So this is a retrospective electronic medical record-based assessment of new neurological or psychiatric diagnoses that occur after acute infection with SARS-CoV-2. What I love about this study is that they made a comparison to people who were diagnosed with flu or other respiratory tract infections during the same time period. So in a sense, accounting for some of the pandemic-related stressors that I mentioned on the last slide. They found that COVID-19 associated with a wide range of neuropsychiatric diagnoses above what was observed in the other respiratory infection cohort. So here I'm showing you rates of intracranial hemorrhage, ischemic stroke, uh, muscle diseases, all higher in the COVID-19 group when compared to the other respiratory tract infection group. Overall, they found that the incidence of any neuropsychiatric outcome after COVID-19 was about a third. Interestingly, the incidence of a first neuropsychiatric outcome was much lower, about 
I want to highlight some of what we know about the changes that may occur in the brain after COVID-19 infection. So this is um, a study that has not yet been peer-reviewed and um, that came out in that archive a few months ago that took advantage of the UK Brain Bank study. So this was a large tens of thousands of individuals are enrolled in the UK Brain Bank. And many of these individuals underwent brain scans years ago before COVID-19. The study was then put on hold because of the pandemic. And then once the researchers were able to open up and operate again, they were able to actually call back many of those individuals for whom they had a pre-pandemic brain scan and now scan them again. And in doing so, they could compare individuals who in the course of that time period had received a COVID-19 diagnosis versus those who did not. So overall, they had um, almost 400 cases of COVID-19 and matched controls. Um, and had pre and post pandemic scans for these two groups. Importantly, amongst the patients with COVID, most of them had mild or no symptoms, meaning they were um, included on the basis of an antibody test only. The results of this study were that they found that there were small losses of brain matter in certain brain regions, um, primarily those related to the sense of smell, um, and as well as a few additional regions and that these findings were most profound in the patients who had been hospitalized, which was a very small subset from the larger study. So here I'm just showing you an example of um, one of the regions involved in smell where they found a decrease in gray matter. And you can see here in the uh, cases in orange compared to the controls, uh, that in the controls over most ages, there was no change in the volume of that brain region um, when comparing pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, um, there's a paradoxical increase in the gray matter size with increased age in that group. Um, but in the COVID cases, there's a, uh, a decline in the thickness of that region of the brain that occurs even at the younger ages that were sampled and is much more profound in the older ages that were sampled. So it's a very intriguing study, I think, um, really nicely done because we have the pre and post, but of course, many questions and limitations. So the authors find a correlation, but of course cannot prove causality based on this study. We don't know if the brain changes that were found are a result of CNS viral infection or a response to symptoms like smell and taste loss. So in other words, is the brain um, revising its architecture to compensate for that? Um, is this a change that happened in response to hypoxia? or related to other stressors from the pandemic, including potentially increased isolation amongst those who tested positive for COVID. And of course, we need long, further longitudinal studies to understand whether these changes are permanent or whether they reverse with time. So with that background and all the caveats of what we, um, we still need to learn about the epidemiology of neuro-COVID, um, Dr. Spiedrich and I have undertaken the COVID mind study at Yale which is an observational study of post-acute COVID-19 neurological symptoms. For this study, we're using many of the same approaches we took during acute COVID-19, including profiling the blood and the CSF for markers of immune activation and neuronal injury, neuropsychiatric testing to um, try to obtain objective measures of cognitive impairment in our groups, and very detailed history and surveys to understand both acute and post-acute symptoms in our research participants. This study um, has been going on for a few months. It's still ongoing, but I wanted to share with you today some of our preliminary data. So we've now enrolled um, 27 participants into the post-COVID cohort. So these are all people who had a documented infection with COVID-19 and now have a neurological symptom. We, um, for the blood and CSF, compared our findings in this cohort against a group of pre-pandemic controls that we had previously enrolled into research prior to 2020. You can see that our post-COVID cohort is primarily female, primarily white, with an average age of 53. Most of these patients were not hospitalized during their acute COVID-19. Um, and in terms of the neurological symptoms, the most frequently reported complaint is of cognitive impairment. 
most of these patients did not undergo um, MRI, but amongst those who did undergo a clinical MRI of the brain, um, all were normal except for one, um, sorry, except for two MRI scans. So what are we learning? When we ask our patients to, our participants to think back to what were the symptoms they experienced during acute COVID-19, you can see here that these really mirror what has been reported previously in the literature. So fever, respiratory complaints, loss of smell and taste, very common. At the post-COVID visit, as I mentioned, the most frequent symptoms are of memory, word finding, concentration difficulties, but also really high rates of depression and anxiety reported in our participants. Headache is frequent, followed by fatigue, um, and then numbness and tingling, peripheral neuropathy symptoms. We collected blood from our participants in the post-COVID cohort, and as I mentioned, compared them to blood that had been biobanked from pre-pandemic controls. As a first pass, we wanted to assess for whether there were any overt signs of inflammation systemically in these participants. So we found no difference in blood CRP levels between our post-COVID participants and controls. We found a slight increase in blood D-dimer. So you can see we had um, some participants who have really uh, persistently elevated D-dimer levels when compared to controls, um, and most participants fell in the normal category. We didn't find any major differences in T cell subsets, just looking at CD4s and CD8s in the post-COVID versus control. Um, and then looking at the CSF, um, we first looked at CSF neopterin, which is a marker of microglial activation, no difference um, between the two groups. Um, and then further looking at CSF, um, we found that while the CSF white blood cell count was not significantly elevated in the post-COVID group, there appeared to be a slightly lower proportion of CSF lymphocytes and an increase in CSF neutrophils and monocytes when compared to controls, um, and a normal CSF protein, a normal CSF serum to albumin ratio, which is a marker of blood-brain barrier breakdown. So our conclusions were really that there were no overt immunological um, differences in the blood or the CSF of the post-COVID participants compared to controls. But of course, we want to now take a deeper dive um, to do some deeper immunophenotyping of these participants. We wanted to um, ask whether the antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 that we had previously found in CSF, do those persist long after acute infection? Um, and so here we're looking at CSF um, reactivity against the spike protein and against the nucleocapsid protein. Most of our participants did have um, continued detectable levels of um, these antibodies in the CSF. Even you can see 300 days after initial infection. Um, we had two participants who had already been vaccinated, and so we've colored their results differently. Actually, interestingly, they seem to have the lowest responses in their CSF. Um, this is something that we need to continue to follow in the larger group. Um, and in the blood, most of our participants, not surprisingly, continue to have detectable antibodies um, in their blood against the spike, and in most cases against nucleocapsid as well. So as I mentioned, it's really just our preliminary data for the post-COVID group, and our next steps are to continue to collect standardized neuropsychiatric testing to complement the symptom reports that we're querying. And this is in close collaboration with Dr. Leah Rubin at Hopkins. And um, we're going to continue to measure CSF and blood immune markers, but hopefully using more um, deep immunophenotyping approaches. We continue our collaboration with our colleagues at UCSF and we'll be screening our post-acute participants for the presence of autoantibodies in the CSF. Um, and Dr. McAlpine, very excitingly, is initiating a neuroimaging study um, to look for MRI correlates of past neurological symptoms. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your attention for this talk. Utmost thanks goes to our study participants. It's um, very generous of people to agree to participate in a lumbar puncture based study. Um, I think it provides crucial information that we really can't get any other way. And we're so grateful to our study participants. Many people at Yale and at UCSF contributed to this work and especially want to highlight um, our neuro ID team at Yale, um, Serena, Lindsay, many others.
Dr. Iwasaki and Eric um, and Albert Coe, who worked with me on um, a lot of the acute studies that I showed you and the group at UCSF. Um, I'm so grateful to the NIH for funding me um, first through a career development award, um, which really, I think, set me up to be able to do these studies when COVID hit. Um, and I'm also funded by Merck through an investigator studies program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Verhaney. That was a really great talk, really exciting work. Uh, we have some time for questions. There's a few questions that are already in the in the in the Q and A, and we have one in the chat to start with. Uh, I can just read the questions from Libby Higgs. How common is it to have differential antibody profiles between CSF and plasma? Thank you for your question, Libby. I had the same question when we first saw these data, and I think the answer is we don't know because these are not the kinds of studies that we or other people have done before in the context of other diseases. So I think it's an interesting new area to be pursued, not just in COVID, um, but to really understand how other systemic infections affect the brain. So I think the answer is that we don't know, but people like Michael Wilson at UCSF are really gonna be crucial to getting to the bottom of that. And so uh, Kent Lloyd has a question. The different immune responses, antibody and cytokines observed in plasma versus CSF suggest a different effect of virus on cells behind the blood-brain barrier. Can you speculate on the role of neuroplin-1 in facilitating CNS access by SARS-CoV-2 and how this might warrant an investigation of ther and therapeutic strategies targeting NRP1 to prevent neurological pathogens? Uh, thank you, Ken, for your question. I'm really not familiar at all with the role of NRP1 in facilitating CNS access of the virus. Um, I would like to learn more about that. So happy to be in touch with you afterwards. Okay. Uh, from uh, Tracy Fisher, were the studies demonstrating antibody reactivity to mouse neurons validated or explored in postmortem human brain with and without SARS-CoV-2 infection? I love that question. No, it has not been done. I will say that the targets of some of those autoimmune antibodies have been validated through cell-based assays, and Dr. Bartley continues that work, um, but we have not explored um, postmortem human brains um, as a substrate for uh, exploring immunoreactivity. It's a really great question. Uh, question, uh, let's see. Uh... From, I guess, is this from uh, Michelle? Oh, this is from uh, Walter Koretz. Uh, Michelle Mussenswag did a, a, a study in B cells in the gut with evidence that the clones are changing, suggesting that there's a persistent viral stimulation. Any chance you can do this with B cells in a CSF or, or just too few? So we're really looking at truly a handful of cells in the, of B cells in the CSF. Um, you know, less than 50 uh, for sure. So all that B cell receptor data is coming off of very, very few cells um, that I don't think can be isolated for downstream experiments necessarily. You know, once we do the single cell, the cell is dead. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to think about a little further whether there are other ways, you know, to bait these cells from the CSF. I don't know. Uh, uh, Kent Lloyd put a, a citation from Science about uh, uh, NRP1. Uh, I have a question. Um, the, the fact that you don't see antibodies in individuals that have come in after post you know, I guess post-infection vaccination, does that suggest that immunization prevents uh, some sort of autoimmune reactivity? I, I'm trying to understand that data. Yeah, so let me just pull that up again. And I wanna be really clear that it is, okay, so first of all, it's just two people. So I don't wanna make any conclusions, but I will say that this is looking in the serum looking at antiviral antibodies, these two people had extremely low levels of anti-spike antibody 
in their serum despite being vaccinated. Uh, to me, this says something about those two people not being really great uh, vaccine responders. Uh, the fact that they didn't respond in the serum, I think makes it less um, surprising that they also um, that they also didn't respond in the CSF. So um, I don't think it says anything about autoimmunity. And again, it's just two people. So okay. the vast majority uh, of people who are vaccinated will develop an antibody response. Okay, so Ryan Connor, were you able to measure glutamate in the CSF blood and or astrocyte function in the mouse model? We, we've never done any studies measuring glutamate. Um, and we don't have a mouse, I'm not showing you data from a mouse model here. So here we're just using the human CSF to stain mouse brain tissue. Um, but, you know, work with, that we've done with Eric Song, um, we do have a, Eric has a mouse model of neurological um, infection where um, the human ACE2 receptor is expressed only in the brain. And I didn't go through that data today, but no, we've never measured glutamate. Okay. Um... Any other questions? I guess um, I'll ask one that's, I think it's, it's kind of related in some ways to um, the, uh, the persistence of, of virus in terms of that, that Walter asked, which was the, the looking at B cell changes, changes in, in um, uh, antibody in, in B cells uh, because of, of uh, potentially persistent virus, but you showed that there may be ac actually some um, uh, autoimmunity or, or you know epitopes that are being recognized in cells that would also potentially, I would guess, be, could be, play a, a role in maturation. And I wonder if that is you know, an alternate um, explanation. And I guess the other thing that I wanted to ask is I, I realize you don't have that many B cells in CSF, but um, is, is the, was the, the distribution, in, you know, IgM, IgG, et cetera, uh, this, the same between blood and, and CSF or was it, you know, dramatically like all IgG in, the, in CSF? And so changes, you know, maybe changes in, in maturation across right. the BBB? So no major changes, but the specific frequency I have to get back to you on. I just want to go back to what you said about autoimmunity driving some of the um, uh, B cell changes that might occur over time. I think mm -hmm. that that's very true. And especially since we see cross reactivity against viral antigen and self antigen, that I think that's certainly um, another possible reason and alternate to persistent viral stimulation. So um, I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, a couple more comments uh, that are in the chat uh, from Tracy Fisher. Our NHP model of SARS-CoV-2 infection shows significant astrogliosis in acute infection. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, you know, it would be different from what's been reported in the human autopsy studies. But again, autopsy is at a single point in time, often far out from the acute infection. So when you look at those um, autopsy cohorts, many of those patients had been hospitalized for quite a long time before they underwent brain autopsy. And so I think um, what we're capturing on the human autopsy studies may not be technically acute infection. So it's interesting and important to have those kinds of models. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very important uh, consideration. Uh, let's see, uh, Kent Lloyd comment. Absolutely, and I agree, absolutely fantastic and intriguing presentation. So thank you so much. Sorry. Well, okay, so yeah. I really was really fortunate to have such a nice audience. Um, and I appreciate all of you for your questions. Great, that was great. So many, so, so, so much information and, and a lot of, generates a lot of questions, a lot of new direction. So we're really glad these are, are recorded. We're gonna have transcripts available. You can, people can watch them again. And uh, we look forward to continuing this. This has been a really great series. And thank you so much, Dr. Perhadian, for, for your contribution to this.
Great. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you all, Jay. And I know Josh had to drop off, uh, but great, great job picking terrific seminar speakers. So this was yet another uh, fascinating uh, talk. And uh, Dr. Rahadian, thank you again. And uh, as as it's been pointed out, this will be um, uh, on the, the website and we'll be uh, talking to, uh, putting it into some minutes kind of uh, white paper in the in the near future, all of which can be found on the FNIH website. So um, we will look forward to uh, hearing from you again. And uh, thank you very much for everyone for everyone's attention and have a good day.